going in a different direction from my usual videos. Um, today is not a Latin tutorial like I normally do. Um, today I am going to hit the very, very basics for the absolute beginner on the violin. Um, I'm going to hit um, the violin's anatomy talk about the different parts so that when your teacher says, you know, your your finger needs to be closer to the nut, you know what that means. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what you should be looking for if you're beginning, if you're going to be buying a violin. Um, some helpful tidbits on shoulder rests, chin rests. Um, Things like that. Um, how to hold the violin and keep it secure on your shoulders so that you're not squeezing um, and trying to hold it up with your left hand. And we'll talk about the names of the strings and how to tune. Um, and so anyway, let's get started. I have my violin here. Uh, this is the one that I use. Um, and we're going to start at the top and we're going to work our way down. So this is the scroll. It kind of looks like a scroll. It's all curvy. Um, pretty easy to remember. This is your peg box and on either side of your peg box you're going to have your tuning pegs. Okay. And each tuning peg corresponds to a string on your violin and you're going to need to know which string it corresponds to so you can tune properly. Um, for a lot of violins, you won't have to use these unless you're doing a big job. Um, let's say you just got your violin and you have to set up the bridge and all of that, you'll need these guys. Um, but a lot of them, especially the student models, have fine tuners down here. Now, I don't, and I will talk about that. But a lot of them do. Um, the ones that I originally started learning on had fine tuning pegs down at the bottom. And so for the little jobs, when your A string was an A flat and you just needed to tighten the string a little bit to get it up where it needed to be, you could use your fine tuning pegs. If your A string was an F, then you needed to use your, your tuning pegs because that's a bigger job. It'll take you, you know, ages to... Um, so, anyway, uh, that's what these are. When you turn them back, you tighten the string. When you turn them forward, you loosen the string. Tightening the string will bring the pitch up, okay? And loosening the string is going to bring the pitch down, all right? And you'll want to be playing the, playing the string as you're tuning, um, you know, put it up in playing position and be messing with the tuning pegs or the fine tuners um, while you're playing the string and your tuner is listening to you. That way you can hear it going up or going down. It's also just good to get used to hearing what it's supposed to sound like and the different variations in between really, really off and really, really on point. Um, so, um, the names of your strings, since we're on the topic of tuning, the top string that's going to be farthest that way behind you, okay, the thick string is your G string, okay, I can't even see that, G string, D string, A string, and the little tiny hair-like guy at the bottom is your E string. He's your highest note. He's your lowest note, okay? They go in fifths, okay? So each, each note that these strings play is a fifth higher than the string before them. So from G to D is a fifth. D to A is a fifth. A to E is a fifth. And all that means is that you count Counting on G, if you have a keyboard or you know some music theory, you count one, two, three, four, five notes up. Counting the string like G, starting on G, count G, A, B, C, D. D is your fifth, okay? So that's all that means. When somebody says that it's a fifth, it just means that it's five notes up. 
or five notes down. Okay, you can go in reverse too. You can, you can do a fifth lower or a fifth higher. That's all it is. Okay, so those are the strings. This black part is your fingerboard, okay? The back here is your neck, okay? This is commonly referred to as the shoulder of the instrument, all right? Uh, your teacher might have you hold it by the shoulder, or if you're starting vibrato, they might have you practice, you know, bending your finger back and forth on the rib there on the shoulder. Um, this guy right here is your bridge, okay? Your bridge is what holds up your strings, okay? And you're going to have a little groove for each string on your bridge. And your bridge needs to be perpendicular to your violin. It needs to be standing up straight. If it's tilted, you got a problem, okay? Um, it needs to be perpendicular and it needs to be lined up. You can't, I don't know if you can see it. See that little notch there in what we call the F holes? We'll talk about those in a minute. But your bridge needs to more or less line up with that little notch in the F hole. Okay, that's the proper placement for your bridge. And you need to know that if you get a violin and it's not set up for you, um, which is common if you order a violin, say on Amazon. Okay, a lot of them don't come set up. So you'll need to be able to put your bridge up. And it's not hard, it's just that you need to know where to put it and you need to know how things are supposed to be when you set it up. Um, you'll notice on your E string, there's a little sleeve right here. That is to keep that E string from digging into your bridge. And that needs to be on the bridge, but not too far forward. If you, if you have that sleeve too far forward, I would, say, I would say past the front of your bridge, then you need to move it back, okay? Because it'll sound like somebody's putting their finger on your E string when you're trying to play it. And it's gonna sound squeaky and horrible, okay? It's not gonna sound good. So you don't wanna do that. You wanna have it back, pretty much lined up with the front of your bridge, okay? Um, if it's not, it's easy to move. It's just a little piece of plastic, okay? That's all it is. But it needs to be there because otherwise your E string is so thin, it'll actually cut into your bridge. And if it gets to a certain point, then it's gonna mess up your playing. So there you have it. All right, these are your F holes. This is where the sound comes out, okay? And also, if you look inside your F holes, and I'm not even gonna try to do it on the camera because you probably won't even be able to see it. It's not worth the effort. Um, if you look inside your F hole, you will see a label usually there are some violins that don't have labels. Um, usually they're mass produced violins from like China or something, there's no label. Uh, this one has a label, many, many, many violins have labels. And if you're ever buying a used violin, you can always ask the person to tell you what that label says on the inside so you know the model, um, the maker of the violin, who made it, the model, you can do your research and find out, well, how much is it worth retail and how much are they asking for? Um, it's a really good idea because you just never know. If, I mean, if they're asking you for $300 and there's no label and <laughs> there's, you know, there's no proof that it's anything special, then maybe not. Um, these are your fine tuners. I don't have fine tuners. I have one E string fine tuner. Um, the story there is that it's not really a big deal either way. Okay. Um, having fine tuners, not having fine tuners, whatever. I have seen extremely expensive violins with fine tuners and I have seen, um, less expensive violins with no fine tuners. It really depends on the violin. Um, they say that the fine tuners go away when the string quality is better. On more expensive violins, you're more likely to encounter ones with no fine tuners. Um, well, 
almost no fine tuners. You'll always have an E fine tuner because the E string is really sensitive, okay? And it's harder to fully tune your E string with your tuning pegs. All right, so I don't happen to have fine tuners. What I did do when I got this, because your pegs tend to be pretty hard to turn, um, I got the Whitner fine tuning pegs. Um, makes it super easy to tune with your tuning pegs. Um, it might take you slightly longer to tune because you're, um, you're not having to ratchet those strings the way you do with regular fine tuning pegs, but I'm a huge fan because I am not super strong and trying to get the, trying to get the really minute changes was insanely difficult. Um, so I, I got the Whitner fine tune pegs. I love them. Um, had them installed. I bought them, installed them at a violin shop in town and I got it done for 130 bucks. So, uh, there are ways around the, the very difficult <laughs> battle with the, with the tuning pegs. Um, so your fine tuners down here each correspond to your string. Okay. If I had one over here, this would be my G, my D, my A, and my E is, my E is still there. Okay. I do have an E. So there's that. This is called a tailpiece this part down here, okay? And now we get to some of the fun stuff. Okay, I'm gonna take this off. I have a gel comforter on my chin rest. Um, I think it makes it more comfortable. You'll see people uh, use rags like Hilary Hahn. You'll see her use a cloth. Um, Itzhak Perlman uses a cloth. It's just to provide a little cushion on your chin rest because sometimes it can really dig in. It's not always nice. Um, I like it. It's a personal preference. Do with it what you will. If, if a cloth is fine for you, then use a cloth. Um, this is my chin rest. I got a center mount. This is a flat flesh, which I happen to like. Here's, here's a word of advice. When you buy your violin, whatever violin you end up buying, plan on setting aside money to try out different chin rests, different shoulder rests, um, all that stuff. Because it's incredibly personal what you end up doing. Not every chin rest works for every single player, okay? Not every shoulder rest works for every single player. So you really have to try stuff out. And for that, I recommend going on Amazon, getting it, and trying it out for a couple weeks, and if you don't like it, return it and get a different one. Um, that's kind of been my, Amazon has most stuff that you could possibly want for your violin. Most of the accessories that you might want, you can get on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Um, it's just nice to be able to try it and not fully commit to it. Um, you can go to a shop and try out their stuff but you only get to try it out for a little bit. And it's nicer just to play constantly with that, whatever it is, on your violin, and then decide, like, I, I like it, I hate it, or I liked it at first and now I like it less, I liked it at first and now I love it, um, whatever. So yeah, there's a piece of Velcro stuck here because that's how these gel comforters stay on. Um, I got a center mount. Uh, most violins, including mine, come with a side mount, okay? So it'll, it'll uh, sit a little differently. You're gonna have it over on this side, okay? And um, it's a personal preference. If you like side mounts, use a side mount. If you prefer a center mount, use a center mount. You just have to try them out. And there are different brands, different styles. You can, you can have a heyday. And yes, that's my bird talking, well, not really talking, just hooting in the background. We have a lot of birds. Um, so, um, your, your chin rest is going to attach with these bars. Um, I should do a video on how to change a chin rest because it's really easy. Uh, 
it's really easy. You can definitely do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Um, so that's how that works. Um, the little feet grab onto the bottom here, okay? And you just tighten it down and it stays on. All right, so on the back of your violin, you want to make sure if, if you are shopping for a used violin, if you're going to buy a secondhand violin, um, either A, get it through a reputable retailer of some kind, or B, listen up really carefully, okay? Um, one thing that you wanna make sure of if you're gonna buy a used violin is that your violin has no cracks, none. No cracks whatsoever. Do not, bird, getting loud. Do not fall for the lie that, oh, it's just a little crack. It doesn't affect the play at all. It will. The crack is only gonna get larger, okay? Do not buy a cracked violin under any circumstance. I don't care. I don't care. It, it's not worth it. You will suffer because of it. So no cracks, no warping, no holes, other than your F holes, obviously, you want F holes, but do not buy a violin that doesn't have a straight neck. If the neck isn't straight, if, uh, if the, you know, the workmanship is, is defective in any way, don't get it, okay? It needs to be in good shape. You'll want to know um, whether or not the strings are in good shape. Uh, ask them when the last time was that they played it for one because a violin that's sat around for years and years in somebody's attic is probably going to need some, some tender loving care. It might play just fine, but you probably will have to do some serious... Um, tweaking let's just put it that way okay these have to be played it's like a muscle if you don't use a muscle it gets flabby and people my age understand all about flabbiness um so make sure that it's been played make sure that the strings are in good shape if they're not you're gonna have to take that into account if somebody wants a stonking amount of money for a violin that's got really lousy strings or you know whatever and you're gonna have to take it to the shop to get it fixed i would strongly recommend you tell them look a new set of strings is going to cost me this much to get bought and installed so i'm gonna take that out of what i'm willing to give you okay so play a little hardball um i would really recommend buying new i just think that especially as a beginner that's your safest bet um, for a student, for somebody who's just beginning, I do not recommend that you spend more than 600 bucks. And the reason I say that is because if you aren't absolutely confident that you are going to be playing for a very long time, um, there's no sense in dropping 1200 or more on a violin. However, do not, and I will repeat this, do not buy a $20 violin on Amazon. Don't do it. You will regret it. Because the worst thing as a beginner is to have a violin that by nature makes you sound worse than you already sound. Okay? You, it's hard to learn this instrument. It's not easy. And if anybody tells you that it's super easy, either they're like a wonder child and they just play very naturally or they're lying, okay? Um, Itzhak Perlman doesn't consider it easy. So if he doesn't consider it easy, it's not easy. He's amazing, amazing. Um, so it's not easy, it's hard. It's way harder than the piano. It's way harder than the guitar it's it's just hard so um i'm not trying to discourage you but take that into account if you're buying a violin because you play in your school orchestra or whatever keep in mind if you're not planning on playing this after you get out of school 
um, then don't spend a heaping amount of money. Don't make your parents take out a second mortgage to fund your violin because it's not gonna be worth it. They don't sell for the same amount that you bought them for. If you buy a violin for 600 bucks, you're not gonna be able to sell it for 600. You will not get your money back. And they don't fly off the shelves because not everybody plays the violin. You'd have an easier time selling a keyboard or a flute. It's just not the most common instrument, okay? So somewhere in my opinion, and everybody has their own opinion, just like belly buttons for every person, there's an opinion. My opinion, you can take it for what it's worth, you should probably budget somewhere between 200 and 600 bucks. Um, I kind of like the middle of the road figure around 400. Okay, $400 will get you a decent student model. Um, beyond that, you have to play them and listen to them and see how it sounds. Just play open strings and see if you like the tone of the violin. It took me a long time to find a violin that I liked the tone. I like a darker tone. I like something that's deeper and darker. I don't like the really bright sounds. Um, I had a couple violins that were really bright and I didn't like it. It just sounded bad to me. Um, I bought this one. This one is rather expensive. Um, and it's got a nice, mellow, dark tone. When people refer to dark, mellow tones, they mean that it's deeper, it's, it's um, not as, not as, oh, pitchy. Um, when you get the brighter tones, it tends to be sharper. I guess that's the best way to put it. It sounds sharper, it's not as soft and mellow. I like soft and mellow. Okay, so the violins that are soft and mellow rock my world. Um, Strad copies tend to be brighter, although most people can't tell the difference. They tend, to, they tend to have a sharper tone than, say, something like mine, which is not a Strad copy. Um, and so you really do have to just play them and see if you like them. And that's another thing you can do on Amazon. You can order a violin on Amazon if there isn't a great way to go to a shop and just tell them your budget and say, I need a student model. I'm looking to spend 500 bucks. What do you have? Because almost everybody will have a few at least. Um, if you can't do that, then get on Amazon and look. You can bring it home, you can try it out for a week, and then you can ship it back if you don't like it and get a different one. Try it out, ship it back if you don't like it. Um, you can ask your teacher for recommendations. I have asked every teacher I've ever had and none of them has ever said, I like this kind the best. Um, because it's an incredibly personal decision. It just is. It, it's whatever sounds good to you. Oh, another thing, if you're going to be buying a used violin, is if you look inside the F-hole, you can see um, it's about the diameter of a pencil, maybe a little bit bigger. You'll see this post standing up underneath your bridge, okay, inside your violin. That's your sound post. Make sure that it's standing up, it's not broken, okay? That's another thing. If, if you go like this and you hear rattling, don't do it, okay? Because they'll have to dismantle your violin to fix that sound post. So that's an expensive day at the violin shop. And especially if you're buying used and you're paying, you know, two, three hundred dollars for a used violin and it's already got stuff wrong with it, you may as well just buy new and buy nicer, really. Um, so, 200, 600 bucks, that's what I recommend. Take it for what it's worth. Um, you know, it's worth the price of admission. Okay, so we hit that. Um, let's talk about maintaining your violin. I'm gonna put my little gel rest back on here. Okay. Um, it's not hard to maintain your violin, but you do have to do it. Um, first of all, 
the the rosin that you use um, this is what I mean by rosin this is mine uh, I like Perostro's rosin uh, yeah it looks really weird in the camera okay so this is what I use this is the one I like again it's gonna be a personal preference there's no right or wrong rosin to use I've tried six or seven of them and this is just the one that I like the best and it's no more expensive than any other um, average rosin. It, there's some really, really cheap rosin out there. I've never tried it. I don't know if you like it, rock out. If you don't, then get something better. Um, but this will create a dust when you play. When you rosin your bow and you play, you are gonna get this dust. And it even collects on your strings, and I have not, you know, my strings are actually pretty clean right now. I haven't played today, so um, they're not half bad right now. But you'll see, you'll see the rosin start to, start to build on your strings. You'll see a dust on the body of your violin underneath the strings. Um, you want to clean that off. And it's not hard. You can do it. Um, it just takes a couple minutes with a cleaning rag of some kind. I have like four or five of them. And I have one for the cleaning off of my, of my violin and I have one for cleaning the strings. And the reason I do that is because I use these guys. Um, this is my favorite. This is my favorite stuff to use for cleaning my violin. I've tried a few different things. I don't like anything as much as I like this. This is my choice in string cleaner, okay? You just put a little bit on a cloth and you wipe your strings and don't get it on your, don't get it on the varnish of your violin. But this stuff is really nice for taking rosin off. It's uh, old master string cleaner. You can get it on Amazon, it's like 10 bucks, okay? And then for cleaning my, my violin, cleaning the varnish, the wood, Okay, I use Hill and Sons, okay? Um, put a little dab on a cloth and you just wipe it, buff it, and it looks beautiful. Shiny, lovely, clean. Um, and you at least want to take a dry, clean cloth, soft, not, don't do something like, you know, don't do a scrubbing pad or anything like that. You'll kill your violin. Um, use this and just wipe. That's all you have to do. Okay, and get underneath your fine tuning pegs and get underneath the strings, underneath your fingerboard. Just go at it um, until the dust is cleared off. If you don't, it's gonna build and it's going to start to eat away at the varnish on your violin over time. It'll take years but still most people if you spend um a considerable amount of money don't want their violin to have um nasty spots eaten away at it after a few years so um make sure that you clean it after every time you play whenever you're done just wipe your strings down wipe your violin down get the dust off get the rosin off there are rosins that claim to have um, low dust, less dust. Um, if you like those, great. It might help you. Uh, it might lessen the amount you have to clean. If, uh, if you try it and you don't care for it, then get a different rosin. Again, rosin is just another one of those things where it's a personal preference. Um, so, whatever. Get, get whatever rocks your world uh, same thing with bows I have tried bows that were 200 bucks I've tried bows that were 20 bucks um, and actually I have a $30 bow that's not half bad and I have a bow that was closer to 200 bucks that I don't like I just don't like it it doesn't it doesn't work for me so um, my bow is is not all that expensive but it works for me it was like 50 bucks it's nothing fancy it's nothing special 
Some people will argue that it makes a huge difference. Some people will argue that it doesn't. Um, I argue that it's whatever sounds good to you. And if you can hold it properly and you can play properly with it and your bow's not bouncing and you're comfortable and you like the way that you cross your strings when you're playing and you like the way it produces tone, then it's the bow for you, period. End of story, okay? It's as simple as that. Um, most of the time when you buy a violin in a shop, you will not get a bow with it, okay? Um, they do have from time to time like a student set where you will get a bow, beginner's rosin, a violin, maybe a set of strings that you can change if you want to, um, or if you need to, because you will need to every six months or so, you'll need to change your strings. Um, but most of the time, if you, if you don't buy a student kit, a student set, then you won't get the bow with the violin. So that'll be a separate purchase, just so you know. Um, there are, uh, there are kits on Amazon. Uh, the second violin I ever had was a student kit and it was actually a lot better than the first one I owned. The first one I owned, the strings were so hard to push down to the fingerboard. It was so hard. And I thought, I can't even, I can't even see myself playing if I have to push this hard on the strings. And I switched, got a different one, worked out really nicely. The strings were super easy to push down. Not a problem. Um, let's talk about shoulder rests. There is some debate because everybody has their opinion. Uh, there are some purists who think that you should not use a shoulder rest because, you know, Heifetz and those guys, uh, they didn't use shoulder rests. Um, and I don't, I don't think Itzhak Perlman uses one. I could be wrong, but I don't think he does. Um, here's, here's the thing. Shoulder rests are a fairly new, um, a fairly new arrival on the scene, not like last year, but fairly new. Um, people like Heifetz, people like Menuhin, they probably didn't have shoulder rests, okay? Um, shoulder rests just weren't, at least they weren't common back then. Um, my take on it, take it for what it's worth, you pay your money, you take your chances, right? Um, my personal take on it is if you can't play comfortably without one, then you need to have one. If you have a really short neck, you might very well be blessed with the ability to play without a shoulder rest. It might work for you. You have to try it both ways. Um, if, if you want a shoulder rest or need a shoulder rest in order to play, you can do a sponge. I think that's what Hilary Hahn does. She uses a sponge that she attaches to her violin. If Hilary Hahn's using one, I think it's okay. Um, so anyway, yes, you will hear violinists worshiping people like Hilary Hahn and Ray Chen, and they're just, they're some of the greatest violinists out there. So we have to pay homage to the people who inspire us to just give it a go and hope for the best because most of us are not going to be Hillary Hans. Um, so this is my shoulder rest. As you can see, it is massively curved. Um, and I will explain that here in a moment. I have another one here that is not so curved. Okay. Um, I don't like this one. Um, I, at least it doesn't work as well for me. And I heard a theory, I don't know if this is true, but I heard a theory that coon shoulder rests tend to be problematic. And this is, it's not a coon, but it's really, really close to a coon. I've owned three or four different coon shoulder rests. Um, and I had the same problem with all of them and this one, which is an Everest, I believe. Yeah, Everest. Um... I heard that if you have broader shoulders, 
those tend to be problematic. These coons and this Everest and all that. I don't know if that's true or not, but for me, the problem was my violin never felt secure. It never did. Um, if I wore anything other than a 100% cotton t-shirt, it felt like it was sliding around on my shoulder. Um, I didn't have any faith that my violin was going to stay on my shoulder. Everybody's different. Um, you have to just try a bunch of different shoulder rests and see what works for you. Everybody's gonna have their own preference. It's just, it's the way it is with this instrument. I like Bon Musica, that's what I use. Um, I just love the way it feels, I love it. It's a little more expensive. It's about the same as an upper end coon. Um, maybe a little less expensive than an upper end coon, but you just have to try it out and see what works for you. They're really easy to put on, okay? The curvy part is gonna be the part where your shoulder is, okay? So the part with the biggest curve here is where your shoulder goes, okay? So um, put it on, because if, if you look at this, you can see one end definitely curves up more than the other. Um, it's a little steeper, it's just it, more of a curve. That's the part that goes on your shoulder. If you need an easier example, here. Okay, there's definitely a part where your shoulder goes right here. Okay, so you want to put it on. These little feet will hang on to the ribs on the bottom of your violin. Okay, and your shoulder rest will sit like that on your shoulder. You don't want this part on your shoulder because, well, that's just not going to be comfortable at all especially since you have to put the weight of your head down on your violin in order to keep it in place. Okay, so there you have that. Um, again, try out a bunch of different ones. If you have a short neck and you can get away without one, fine, do it, okay? If you need one in order to play your best, get one. Easy enough. All right. So how do we hold this baby? Assuming that you've never picked up a violin and you don't know what you're doing because all of us have been there when we picked up our violins. You have your violin, it's all set up, it's ready to go. What do you do? Okay, so what I want you to do, if you have a violin, it's nice to practice. Hold your violin by the shoulder, okay, right here, and pick it up, hang on to it, don't drop it, and put it on your shoulder. The There's a little button here on the back. If you don't have this gel comforter, you'll be able to see it. There's a button back here. It should be sitting right about here on your neck, okay? That's about where it should be pointed, okay? So, put my violin on my shoulder and all I'm gonna do is put the weight of my head down. Don't smash your head into it, okay? That's not, you're gonna end up with tension in your neck and you're gonna hurt your neck. Don't do it, okay? It should be a nice, easy, I set my head down, okay? And I can lift my hand up and I can drop my hand down. Lift up and down. And you really do have to get used to doing this. I have actually spent time practicing walking around the house with my violin in playing position, okay? Um, oh, one last thing on the anatomy. I said, I mentioned the nut, okay? Uh, this right here, this ridge is the nut, okay? Just because I said I was gonna cover it and I suddenly remembered that I didn't cover it. That's what they mean by the nut, okay? All right, so practice just putting your violin up, okay? The butt of it should be right around here, underneath your jaw, kind of, see the angle right here where you have the 
a little curve, okay? If you if you come down from that angle, that's about where your violin's going to be pointing. Okay? And it should be sitting out straight. You don't want it, I don't want to let it droop. You don't want it to be down. You don't want it to be up. You want it to be out straight. Okay? Nice and straight. And also, it's called a chin rest, but really it should be called a jaw rest. You're not going to be like playing like this. Okay, that's ridiculous. It's not comfortable. It's not even realistic. You can't. <laughs> There's just no way. So nice, comfortable, just rest your head on your on your chin rest. When you're ready, take your hand away. Do you feel comfortable? Don't hunch up. If you have to hunch your shoulder up, there's something wrong. Your shoulder should stay neutral, okay? But you should feel comfortable enough to drop your arm, okay? Raise your hand up, put your hand down, and up, and down. You should feel comfortable enough to turn a little bit. You're not going to have to do Jane Fonda aerobics while you're playing the violin, but you do need to have freedom to move a little bit. Okay? So, shoulder rest or no shoulder rest. On your shoulder, that button on the back of your violin pointed at your neck. Okay? And it should be straight out. Your shoulder should not have to hunch up. Okay, if it does, you need to either adjust your shoulder rest or get a shoulder rest. All right. Um, and that's how you hold your violin. Now, let's talk about the next thing that you're going to need. You're going to need a bow. Okay. This is mine. It is not a super expensive bow, um, but I like it. I like the way it sounds. I like the way it plays. You can you can spend upwards of thousands and thousands of dollars and you can spend very little on on a violin bow. Uh, what I would recommend is that you stay away from bows where this piece right here, this is winding. A lot of bows have like silver or brass or some sort of winding here. This little part here should be leather, not plastic, okay? Um, and the reason I say that is because it helps to have something that's stopping your finger from sliding, okay? Because what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be taking your thumb, bend your thumb. In fact, the exercise I like the best is you just let your hand go limp. See how your fingers are? See how they're fairly equally distanced from one another. It's not perfectly equal, but you know, it's, they're just nice and relaxed. You bend your thumb, okay, like that. Take your bow, put your fingers down, okay, over your bow, thumb is still bent. Bring your thumb up and put it in between. See the pad right here? And then the top of, this is called the frog down here. Okay, this is the frog, this weird thing. It doesn't look anything like a frog. I don't know why they call it that. Okay, nobody does. I've never heard anybody give an explanation for that. So, bent thumb, relaxed fingers, okay? You're gonna put your thumb between that pad. It's so hard to, there we go. Between that pad and the frog and this little divot here, okay? And your fingers are gonna come down Okay, now your middle finger needs to be across from your thumb. Your pinky needs to be on top. Okay, we're gonna keep our fingers nice and relaxed. Okay, find a nice comfy spot for your, for your index finger. Your pinky needs to be bent and your other fingers need to be relaxed. Okay, so find a nice spot. Your pinky is going to hold your bow and keep it from falling, okay? Your thumb is kind of the fulcrum. If you recall your, your basic physics class or whatever, um, you, have your, you have your fulcrum, you have this finger, 
applying a little bit of pressure and your pinky balancing it out. And you'll use your pinky and your index finger to kind of help you um, maneuver your bow. It'll help you put pressure down when you need to put pressure because you'll find that you need to increase the pressure as you get closer to the tip away from the frog. Down here, you'll need less pressure, okay? But the farther you get up your, up your bow, the more pressure you're gonna have to put. Um, it's, just, it's just the way it works. Um, so, nice relaxed fingers. There are different grips. You have to talk to somebody with more expertise than I have in order to know about all the different kinds of grips. Um, Itzhak Perlman has, has a uh, little talk about different grips. There's a Russian grip, there's a, I don't, whatever. This is what I use, okay? I don't know the name for it. It is just a standard, nothing special violin grip. In fact, I think that's what I'm gonna title it. It's the nothing special violin bow grip, okay? And as you can see, my thumb is bent, okay? And my fingers are relaxed. My pinky is bent. Pinky needs to be bent because you need your pinky to be able to do things like this, okay? All right, but you should not, I had a problem. I have really small hands. Um, and when I first started playing, I had this problem of stretching my pinky, all the dickens out there. And so my pinky was always straight. And everybody else was always like, you need to have a bent pinky. I was like, well, why the heck do I have the only straight pinky on the planet? And I realized it was because I stretched my pinky out all the way to the screw. This is the screw, okay? This is the part that you turn in order to tighten or loosen the hairs on your bow. And I was like, of course it's gonna be straight, especially if you have really tiny hands like I do. I mean, even, even compared to other women, I have small hands. Um, I do, I just, I have like midget hands. So that should be something close to what you have for a bow grip, okay? Nice relaxed fingers, because you need your fingers to be able to move the bow around, have some give and take. You do not want to have tight fingers. Um, and you can, you can look up exercises for improving your, your bow grip strength. Um, YouTube has a bunch of them. Um, so, um, once you, once you can hold your bow comfortably and you kind of have that solved and you can put your violin up in playing position, Okay, bow, violin in playing position. Okay, you can start to play open strings. And remember the, the names of your strings, G, D, A, E, going from the thickest to the thinnest string. Okay, and you can start to play open strings just to get the hang of crossing the strings in a very basic fashion. Um, you will want to play in between the fingerboard and the bridge, somewhere in the middle here. You'll notice that when you get closer to the bridge, the sound gets tighter, um, sharper, and as you get closer to the fingerboard, it mellows out, okay? Somewhere in between there is pretty much the perfect place to play. You want to make sure that your bow is running parallel to your bridge and you're not sawing this way or this way. Um, and you'll have various times in your life where that'll happen and you just have to correct it and try not to do it again and figure out why you're doing it. Um, sometimes it's something as simple as you're concentrating on something completely different and you're not paying enough attention to what you're doing with your right hand because sometimes your left hand can really require a lot of focus and um, your right hand just kind of gets ignored. Um, when you're playing, you should be coming straight out from the middle of your body. 
okay? That's, that's the direction that your bow should be going. You should feel like you're pulling one of those um, Chatty Cathy doll strings, like rant, 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 okay? That's what you should feel like. Um, it should be coming out of the middle of your body, okay? Um, not like or over here or whatever, okay? So a few basics. When you get to the point where you can hold your violin properly and you can hold your bow properly, even if it takes you, you know, doing repeated exercises where you shake your hand out, nice zombie hand, bend your thumb, put it in there, get your fingers arranged comfortably. And there you go. Okay, even if you have to do that 300 times, it's worth the effort because if you don't hold your bow properly, you're not going to bow straight. Your bow's going to bounce. Okay, you're going to have... You're gonna have this. So, you don't want bouncy bow. I have not tuned this, so I apologize if that was out of tune. I think it was a little bit. My A string tends to be a little flat. Um, tuning, you need to tune every time you play, okay? Before you start playing, tune it. There are plenty of free tuners on iPhones, iPads, whatever or you can buy one of those clip-on ones and clip it onto the scroll somewhere and tune it that way. Um, you can also tune by ear. If you have a keyboard, you can play you know, a G and a D and an A and an E, and you can see if your, if your violin is in tune. You'll want to start if you, this might not help you if you don't know anything about piano, but you want to be at middle C on your keyboard when you're tuning your strings, okay? So your G is going to be the G below middle C, okay? It's not gonna be the one up above middle C, okay? Um, your D is gonna be the one just above middle C, okay? Um, what else? What else, what else? You can you can play whatever note. I recommend starting on A. Um, that's the way I was told to tune and it has a lot to do with music theory that I am not a music theory guru. I know enough to be able to play and I know enough to be able to read sheet music and figure out you know what things mean, but if you want to know the ins and outs of music theory, I am not your person. Um, but anyway, start with A and then you can do the strings in any order you want. Um, but start with A. Tune with A first and then do your other strings. Um, I usually do A, D, G, E. That's just the order I typically go in. Um, anyway... Uh, hopefully this was helpful. Um, you can ask me questions if you want uh, in the comment box down below. If I can answer them, I will. If I can't, I will find somebody who can and I will tell you what they said. Um, so anyway, um, hopefully if you're just starting out with your violin, this gave you a little heads up um, and Good luck, have fun, enjoy it, practice every day, work hard, okay? It's, it's hard, but it's, it should be enjoyable and it should be fun because that's kind of the point. Um, and it's a beautiful instrument, it really is. If you need inspiration, I highly recommend looking up Itzhak Perlman or Hilary Hahn or Ingrid Chun or... Uh, you can look up, you know, Heifetz and those guys. Um, you can even watch the scary eight-year-olds that can already play, you know, Mozart better than anybody else in the world. Those are kind of depressing. But, um, you know, for inspiration, I, I love watching Itzhak Perlman. Um, I, love, I love listening to Ingrid Chun, amazing violinist, really talented. 
and they play beautifully. So that's important, I think, just to keep some players that you really enjoy listening to on your Spotify or whatever so that you can listen to them and say, okay, I know what it can sound like and hopefully if I keep working, I can, I can get to the point where I sound really good. Maybe not Itzhak Perlman really good, but I can make this instrument play beautifully if I keep working at it. So that's the goal. I will see you guys later. Bye.